Okay. Everyone can hear me okay? Sweet. All right. Um, so, let me start. Um, thank you, firstly, everyone for coming. Um, yeah, no worries. People are going to filter in. That's cool. Um, but yeah, thanks for coming, everyone. Um, it's been really great being on campus today. It's been really interesting hearing uh, a lot of the different talks that have been going on. Um, and um, yeah, I just feel quite lucky to have been a part of all of this. Um, you know, funnily enough, I almost ended up going to Napier, but um, a bad decision led me down south to England. But it's nice to finally be here after, um, after four years. Um, so, welcome to Espionage Revealed. Um, the main focus, obviously, is going to be about um, the sidewalk malware. Um, if you've read the um, description in the booklets at all, I've rearranged some things, so it's still technically accurate, it's just in different places. Um, so, first, a little bit about who I am. My name's Jordan Ropes. I am a tactical CTI analyst. Um, I work remotely, but live here in Edinburgh. My company's based in London. Um, but yeah, um, I'm not here to talk about my company today. I'm here to talk about something really cool. Um, but if anyone's interested in, you know, the sort of day-to-days of CTI, um, feel free to ask me questions about it. Um, well, yeah, I graduated in 2021, and um, I like coffee. Sure. Um, yeah, so this talk is, it, it sort of came together from like a sort of passion project, really. Um, I um, had initially written a sort of research paper um, on it, but um, uh, I felt like it was important to um, bring it to a place where people can, can hear more about it and understand what makes uh, the malware so cool. Um, but yeah, um, the sort of outcomes that I want to hopefully achieve with this today is to uh, cover how commodity malware is used in real life with a real example. Um, I want to talk about how the sidewalk malware works and what makes it so interesting. Um, and uh, yeah, what makes it so effective as well. And then uh, I also, uh, if we've got time, we'll talk about some similar malware uh, in the current political climate. Um, but yeah, like for the purposes of this talk, like the main focus is going to be a real life uh, backdoor that uh, I found called Sidewalk uh, that was developed by the Sparkling Goblin APT group um, and was used to carry out um, covert surveillance against students and protesters uh, during the Hong Kong pro-democracy protests uh, in January 2021 and later in February 2021. Um, so um, for those of you who might not know or have forgotten uh, what, uh, what happened, um, Basically, these protests originated because uh, the people of Hong Kong weren't very happy about the introduction of a pretty controversial um, extradition bill, um, which would have allowed any criminal suspect in Hong Kong to be extradited uh, to mainland China for their trial, um, which prompted people to become pretty worried about Hong Kong's autonomy. Um, Sorry. Um, <laughs> stop touching shit. Um, sorry. All good? Works now? Not going to touch it. Um, but yeah, um, the protest then sort of, you know, snowballed into a much, much bigger, broader pro democracy movement, um, which were, as you can see, met with pretty brutal opposition from the CCP's police. Um, I don't know specifically what must have been going on within the CCP's cyber operations teams at that point, but I could imagine that they were called upon to figure out a way to root out dissidents, to gather evidence of their intention to protest, uh, and allow the course of what they call justice to uh, take place. Um, so um, the results of these protests um, 
against the dwindling autonomy of Hong Kong resulted in the withdrawal of the uh, extradition bill, but saw the introduction of the uh, Hong Kong national security law, uh, which criminalizes effectively anything uh, which could be considered as uh, disloyalty from China and the, and the state. Um, right. But yeah, um, as I was saying, uh, the results of the protests were that the bill was suspended, um, but saw the introduction of an even more severe law. Um, and um, yeah, I think that these statistics demonstrate the lack of restraint used by police uh, during those riots. 15 people died, over 2,600 injured, over 10,000 arrested, and almost 3,000 charged with uh, criminal charges. Um, yeah, so what is sidewalk? I've been saying this a lot. Um, uh, so sidewalk is uh, what um, researchers um, generally have been referring to as two separate yet identical pieces of malware, one called stage client, one called spectre. They both are the exact same thing, they just work in different ways. So I'm gonna try and make it very clear when I'm talking about each one so that no one gets confused. Um, but yeah, um, Sidewalk is a commodity piece of Linux malware um, originally developed by uh, APT41, um, most likely uh, started development in 2019. Um, and yeah, so the original variant was just called Stage Client, and um, uh, a second one was later discovered, um, but both, yeah, are referred to as Sidewalk Linux. Um, and for the purposes of this talk, and to save time, um, I did most of my analysis uh, on the Stage Client variant. Um, the malware has a huge amount of uh, really interesting, really well-written code, um, uh, which enables covert communication between, um, between the client and a C2, and makes use of Google Docs as a dead drop resolver. Um, and the main function of the malware is effectively just to enable covert communications on a client or target device um, and a C2. Uh, so uh, it periodically communicates with an attacker controlled server using uh, post requests over HTTP or HTTPS. Um, it does this using a number of uh, quite interesting different uh, methods, um, but um, yeah, um, so I'm gonna talk about the, the stuff that's contained within the main function, um, which is effectively where, where the magic happens. Um, so we can see firstly that, um, like this is the order of appearance when I was analyzing the main function. Um, we can see that it starts with ignore signal. Um, it showed actually three different um, implementations of the ignore signal function that they'd written for this. Um, but uh, the main purpose of it is to ignore shutdown signals to keep the machine alive so that it can suck as much data out of it as it can. Um, uh, and uh, there's an identical function in the Spectre variant. Um, then we've got the main uh, juicy bit, uh, run stage client, uh, which executes those four functions uh, that you can see init config is allowed to run init host and start network. Um, init config is quite cool but basic. It just checks the, it does a couple of system checks for you know the OS version, system time, and uh, decrypts its configuration. Um, then init config, no, sorry, that was init config. Um, then is allowed to run is, um, is another really cool um, function which um, checks the, there's another function called is another running which um, determines whether or not the program is actually allowed to run on the machine. Um, they've probably written it in this way to avoid using a mutex. Um, 
a mutually exclusive flag where you can um, basically allows you to identify if an instance of a program is already running. Um, if it is, then it will kill all the processes uh, related to it. Um, uh, then we have uh, init host info, um, which gets the host device name and converts it into a UTF-16 string and uh, then gets the username of the current user um, and gets the boot time of the machine and gets the GUID of the machine and calculates a hash of that information to be exfiltrated. Um, then start network um, is quite cool. Uh, it calls a number of additional functions which um, run a ton of other threads which all um, do the same thing. A theme in this malware is that they use multiple threads to um, carry out the same function, basically. Um, and then, yeah, so start network calls tons of functions and um, calls the module manager. The, the developers actually wrote a module manager specifically for this malware um, to load and unload additional payload modules. Um, but because all the C2 infrastructure is dead now, um, there's no way to know what any of those are, unfortunately. Um, then we have this um, one at the bottom with the, with the squiggly line next to it, um, run stage client, uh, which launches uh, the module manager again and the data exchanger. And uh, the data exchanger um, is a function which stages and sends the data um, in a queue format, so, so it's able to effectively create the post request and encapsulates the data that it wants to send to the C2 in those post requests. Um, so I'm gonna focus a little bit more on the network behavior because that's a big part of this malware, is kind of all it does um, in this form that we can analyze today. Um, so Sidewalk makes use of uh, HTTPS um, or HTTP for its C2 communications, uh, depending on the specific configuration of the malware, um, which enables it uh, to receive commands and additional modules and payloads uh, to be executed on the target device. Um, Sidewalk sends post requests um, to its C2 server um, with uh, special parameters, which I'm not sure, I mean, I'm sure you can make it out from here. You can see uh, at HTTP request add header, there's a parameter GTS ID, and then slightly further down, there's another add header um, GTU VID um, uh, that it adds. Um, now, I couldn't really uh, figure out during my analysis what those um, were meant for. Um, so if anyone's got any guesses, uh, I'd love to hear them. Um, but um, yeah, both variants of the malware stage client and Spectre implement this in slightly different ways. So um, in stage client that we're looking at here, um, the two additional parameters are handled by the uh, set request headers um, function. Um, and then data packets are scheduled for transmission using custom functions like the data exchanger inspector. Um, so they do the same thing, just in slightly different ways. Um, and now, more specifically on the dead drop resolver, because um, I thought it was a really interesting TTP um, that I don't see all too often. Um, um, so it uses, uh, it uses Google Docs as a dead drop resolver, um, which means that the malware is effectively able to establish connection with a C2 server without directly connecting to any malicious domains. Um, and on top of that, the widespread trust of Google Docs um, makes it much less likely for that traffic to be blocked by um, any kind of network firewalls, which provides the, the malware operator with a dynamic platform to host malicious content on. Um, now, my thoughts to this are uh, that They've probably done this in order to sort of increase the difficulty of attribution, but also to extend the longevity of their malware campaign. Um, but yeah, it's quite cool. Um, so 
you might be looking at this and thinking that it's just a document with a really long random string, but uh, it's quite a specific um, string. So um, obviously the Google Docs page isn't available anymore, but if it was, um, it would be a document similar to the one that you just saw, um, just like this, um, with a big, big long string on it um, with what appears to be random values, but um, it's actually um, a very carefully composed string which contains uh, delimiters for better parsing um, and a payload um, which consists of a char char 20 encrypted IP address, the decryption key and a hash of the key which it then uses as an integrity check. Um, sadly because it's not available anymore, it's not possible to learn more about the attacker infrastructure um, so in light of this, I wanted to see if I could trick it into revealing more about, um, about the authors, about where it comes from, what it's connected to. So what I did during my analysis was that um, I used a tool called iNetSim, which I'm sure a few of you know at least, I've seen some nodding heads. Um, um, so I used that to try and simulate a C2 server for the malware to communicate with. Um, but when I executed the, uh, the file uh, within a VM, which was logically connected to um, the server that I'd set up, uh, it did nothing. It did absolutely nothing. Um, so I think that there was probably some kind of anti-VM stuff going on in that thing, but um, I wasn't able to find an awful lot during my analysis. Um, but yeah, it didn't try to do anything at all. It, it didn't even try to scan the network. Um, so I've talked a lot about the malware now. Um, so I'm gonna talk a little bit more about attribution. So attribution in CTI is generally based on a couple of different factors, but mainly TTPs, overlapping infrastructure, and code similarity are the main things that I would personally be looking for. Um, and uh, so the reason that we know that this group, Sparkling Goblin and Sidewalk, um, are connected um, is because of um, code similarity and the reuse of a C2 server, which I'm gonna go into a little bit uh, after this. Um, but generally speaking, um, when it comes to CCP-aligned threat actors, they generally try to use the same malware or tools or use similar malware and tools during their campaigns, which makes attribution for analysts like me pretty difficult. Um, but, um, well, and because of that, there's a sort of realistic opportunity or a realistic possibility rather that, um, that other Chinese state aligned actors might be uh, using this malware further afield. Um, so as I mentioned, the, the group has been tied to this malware pretty conclusively with overlaps of code and C2 reuse. Um, the server in question was actually attributed to um, a previous campaign which also targeted students in Hong Kong um, uh, in May 2020. Uh, the malware that they used in that uh, campaign uh, was dubbed Crosswalk, which is said to be the Windows predecessor to Sidewalk. Um, and they contain many of the same capabilities, but it just is specifically focused on Windows devices. Um, so code similarity. Um, so shown here are two screenshots of uh, both Stage Client, uh, which is on the right, and Spectre, which is on the left. Uh, the main function uh, that you can see on the left carries out effectively the exact same stuff that the main and run stage client functions do uh, in the stage client variant. Um, so we can see um, that it makes use of a function check instance mutex, uh, which does the exact same thing as is allowed to run. Um, and uh, yeah. It does all the same uh, module manager in initialization, host info, start network, all that kind of stuff, um, which is really cool. Um, and now 
how is this connected to the CCP? Obviously, I've talked about the threat groups that are known and attributed to the CCP. Um, but, um, yeah, I'm going to start with some geopolitical um, context for this stuff. So, um, in 2022, there was a national congress in China where Xi Jinping was effectively voted as the general secretary of the CCP again. Um, and uh, referring to uh, national security and particularly to Taiwan, it's clear that the CCP seeks to reclaim Taiwan as part of mainland China and will almost certainly uh, make use of sophisticated cyber operations like the sidewalk malware um, in conjunction with military, access, uh, military action against Taiwan. So alongside this, um, the disruption of civil disobedience and protesting um, plays a very important role for the CCP um, and therefore gathering uh, personal identifiable information on political activists and protesters um, is going to be supplemented by the use of malware um, like Sidewalk and others like Shadowpad that you might have heard of uh, to enable covert collection. So the CCP has what's called a five-year plan. Uh, they come up with one of these every five years, but they're usually the exact same thing, um, which are to raise productivity in China's international competitiveness. Um, so, you know, effectively being their own advocate and, um, you know, trying to reduce imports and produce as much of their own stuff as possible. Uh, gaining technological independence is a very important one for the CCP, um, particularly um, with reference to Taiwan, because Taiwan produces so much more silicon than, uh, than mainland China does. Um, technological independence, um, part of the technological independence goal would be to reunite um, Taiwan with the mainland. Um, then maintaining long-term prosperity of Hong Kong and Macau to me means maintaining long-term control over Hong Kong and Macau. Um, and then the promotion of peaceful development of uh, cross-strait relations, so trying to be friends with everyone possible um, for as long as possible. Um, and then achieving reunification with the motherland. Um, is pretty core to their uh, to their goals as a as a nation, um, and so moving on, um, threat actors attributed to the uh, Chinese state and suspected to be sponsored by the CCP usually engage in the same kinds of information operations like data harvesting, intellectual property theft, um, espionage, all of that kind of stuff. Um, and uh, they do this globally. They hack whoever they want, basically. Um, and socially and politically, the CCP's priorities are pretty heavily influenced by um, a desire to deal with what they call the five poisons. Um, so as part of that are the, uh, the Uyghurs, or Uyghurs, however you pronounce it, um, and the Associated Independence Movement, uh, the Tibetan independence movement and the wider pro-democracy movements within China itself. Um, the, pro, uh, the Taiwanese independence movement and uh, the Falun Gong religious movement, who are all just a bit mad, to be honest. Um, so the CCP uh, does a really good job of applying a sustained and focused effort on controlling the narratives of how they're dealing with these issues, um, with these situations. Um, and they do that by exercising control over information as well as projecting more favorable, albeit inaccurate, narratives around these issues. Um, so effectively propaganda. Um, and uh, although this is something that's most commonly associated with Russian uh, sponsored threat groups, uh, Chinese uh, threat actors will uh, pretty regularly actually make use of um, uh, cyber attacks to facilitate these uh, what they call information operations uh, through 
leaking stolen information and abusing social media to control the narratives around uh, all of these issues. Um, all right, and um, so we've got some time to talk about some other malware now. Um, so obviously the first one that jumps to everyone's mind, I'm sure, is Pegasus. Um, it's easily the most infamous example of commodity spyware uh, developed by the Israeli company NSO Group. Um, interestingly, the malware's been active since at least 2012, um, but wasn't discovered until 2016 when um, a human rights activist actually noticed a failed installation uh, on his phone, um, which sparked a much wider investigation into uh, the spyware's capabilities. Um, and what makes Pegasus so dangerous um, is that it can be installed on your phone without you even knowing it, using zero-click exploits. Um, and once it's on your phone, Pegasus can see everything. Uh, what This screenshot that you can see uh, up here right now is the management interface of Pegasus. And you can just see absolutely everything on someone's phone, um, which is freaky. Um, yeah, it can, it can harvest information from any app on your phone and um, makes use of uh, routing and uh, jailbreaking to elevate its privileges to, to get the access that it needs. Um, and um, yeah. Um, uh, the NSO Group, um, for those of you who might not know, is a technology company based in Israel and um, was actually founded by uh, ex-members of the uh, Unit 8200 um, uh, core of the IDF, which is um, the division responsible for espionage, effectively. Um, NSO claims that they uh, sell this it, responsibly in order to you know, prevent terrorism and, uh, and other kinds of uh, shit. Um, but um, uh, the spyware has been traced to the phones of hundreds of uh, human rights uh, activists, lawyers, um, journalists, politicians. Boris had it on his phone, you know, um, which is pretty, pretty horrible. Um, and yeah, um, another uh, interesting note about Pegasus is that every sale of Pegasus to anyone has to be approved by the IDF themselves. Um, all right. Yeah. Um, so my final thoughts um, on this, because we're coming to sort of coming to the end. Um, you know, is a message that you've probably heard in a couple of words um, in, in a few different ways, but um, we're always being watched. Um, as cringy as it sounds, surveillance is currently at its most abundant. Um, and, you know, you should all know this being cyber people, um, so don't be shocked. Um, the CCP is only one example of a repressive government exercising their cyber capabilities to crush dissent, attack activists, and prevent the truth from being reported. Um, Russia's been guilty of this forever. Israel is, the UK is, even the US, you know, everyone does it. Um, and uh, I think that revealing how spyware works on this level, um, you know, not just on a technical level, but also a geopolitical level, um, is pretty important to improving our collective awareness of cyber-enabled human rights abuse. Um, we've got voices, every one of us has a voice that deserves to be heard, um, and the use of espionage uh, on the level of Sidewalk and Pegasus and every other which piece of malware uh, you could think of um, is going to be used to disrupt our right to be heard, um, and um, we can't let that happen. We, we need to be heard. 
we can do this in a million different ways, you know, like um, going to a going to a march or spray painting a slogan on something or, you know, I don't know, writing letters to MPs or whatever. Um, yeah, just being heard is so important. And um, I hope that after this talk, you feel a little bit more informed on commodity spyware um, and the CCP's role in um, exercising their cyber capabilities and generally have a slightly better um, understanding of what makes spyware so important to oppressive governments. Thank you.